Hello. Uh, ten years ago, we started Seven Investment Management. I'm here with Tom. Tom, why did we start it ten years ago? We had some lovely ideas, Justin, ten years ago, like how easy it was going to be and the markets would always go straight up and life would be lovely. That was it. It was going to be Nirvana, that wasn't was it? That was the one. That, that was, was it, yeah. Actually, we had lived in big companies in our corporate life. And what we found was that there were a lot of things that went on in some of the large companies that we thought maybe weren't always in the customer's best interest. And we had an idea that if we could develop a business that really focused on what was right for the end customer, it would not only be the right thing to do, but it would be good commercially. It was that corny old line that uh, used to come out with, but you're absolutely right, doing the right thing. Yeah, and even to this day, uh, when we have our induction programs for new employees, uh, chapter one of the induction program is doing the right thing, meaning not only that they should be allowed to do the right thing, but they should feel compelled to do the right thing. Yeah, and there was another thing, uh, Ros, Ross Price, our Chief Investment Officer, she came up with, I think, with a very important line, which I think is vital for everybody to remember if they're involved in this industry, that it was a privilege to look after people's money, not a right. And certainly, I found when I looked around the, our investment industry, they took it for granted, and they took their clients for granted, and their clients' money for granted. And that didn't feel right to me. Yeah. Some of the things that we tried to do uh, in order to implement, to give life to doing the right thing, uh, were to be clear and transparent about how we were managing the money, to be clear and transparent about what were the charges, to be clear and transparent about what we thought was going on in the world, and as a result, what were we doing in the portfolios. Well, let's go back to how we're running the money, because that was going to be very different from our old stockbroking world. Yeah, what we, one of the things we observed was that money was managed differently in the institutional world as it was for some of the retail clients. And in the institutional world, let's say corporate pensions, for example, mm -hmm. we found portfolios that were very, very broadly diversified, both in terms of asset classes and in terms of geography. And as a result of that diversification, they tended to be less volatile portfolios. They tended to have a long-term orientation, all the kind of things that a lot of people would like in their own pension. And not just dominated in stocks and shares, as per the usual portfolios you used to deal with. Yeah, the good old stockbroking portfolios were uh, a bunch of UK equities, uh, a couple of gilts, uh, the odd foreign fund, and we call it a discretionary portfolio. Yeah, I think I made a career out of it. Um, but actually, remember, we went, went on to sort of the costs that really got to us as well. It wasn't just the cost of investment management. All those extra costs we used to come across the entire time. Yeah, the, the layers of costs that were built into a lot of the retail portfolios 10 years ago um, by some of the traditional organizations were not only the management fee, but also the dealing costs. The dealing costs could be uh, on the order of 1.6% mm. uh, per transaction. And then if they have a bunch of transactions during the year, that can really add up. Add to that, that number of the people who offer those portfolios were paid on a commission basis, so that the incentive for the investment manager in those organizations was to have trades, and that wasn't necessarily the objective of the client. Now, one particular area that was vital to us as well was not necessarily dealing the old-fashioned way of stockbrokers dealing directly with clients. We felt that actually everybody should go through professional planners. What was the basis of that? Well, like anything else uh, in life, if you have a plan, uh, it sort of helps. As, as my old friend Yogi from the Yankees used to say, if you, you don't know where you're going, you ain't going to get there. Uh, and the personal financial planning version of that is that you should have a financial plan for your family that will give you a roadmap on how it is that you're going to retire at approximately the time that you'd like to retire with approximately the means that you expect to have when you retire. And that could involve pension planning, it could involve inheritance tax planning, it could involve lifetime cash flow planning, uh, lending, protection. There's a wide, wide range of uh, subjects that a financial planner would advise a client on, including the selection of tax wrappers and risk profiles. At the end of all that, you can plug in what goes inside of those different tax wrappers, and at the end of it, then that's what we, they can delegate to people like us. So the investment is the last thing you're doing, not the first thing you're Correct. doing. Right, okay. But also, I mean, we found our industry was very bad at communicating. I mean, you know, they make things dull as possible. I really wanted to try and make it, well, if you can't make it entertaining, at least you can try and make it interesting. It is their money, after all. 
Yeah, I think you coined the word infotaining, uh, and you certainly have been very good about that. And one of the things that you've done and you've brought to 7IM is the ability to take a complex world and bring it down to plain English. And isn't it nice to be able to talk to somebody in language that is very, very understandable to both of you? Well, it's, it's their money, and they need to understand it. But also, I think, an important principle for us both as well, and the rest of the seven, and actually everybody who's working here, this is where our money is too. Yeah, very differently from what we did when we were running those large entities. Mm. Where we wouldn't dare put our money into those portfolios. Uh, you and I and the rest of the management team, we do have our money, our retirement money, uh, in the portfolios that we manage. And it does help focus your attention on what's going on. Yeah. So over 10 years, we've got to the stage now reaching, what, nearly four billion pounds in assets? That's not a bad level. That's a pretty close to what the business plan was when we started it, remarkably enough. Uh, I don't think we got there in exactly the straight line that we drew up in the original business plan. Uh, the world has certainly not gone in a straight line, but the principles that we set out to live by were to find an expected rate of return, to reduce volatility along the way, to reduce cost along the way, to increase transparency of what's going on, to communicate to that people. It's really common sense mm. applied to the investment world. Practical common sense. I think they called it radical common sense when we started. That was right. I hope that gives you some idea as to why we set up seven, what our tenants and principles are. And if you already have money with us, thank you very much indeed. It is our privilege to look after it. And if you'd like to know more about what we do, then please do get in contact. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. Thank you.